Um, ladies and gentlemen, delighted to be here with you. Uh, today I hope to cover in about 40 odd minutes an area which has been fascinating me for more like 14 odd years and which has been the effort of a large group of people called the TEEB community uh, and large number of uh, economists, ecological economists, environmental economists, sociologists, biologists, zoologists, ecologists and, and uh, people from policy space, people from business, people from finance, all of them involved in trying to make uh, sense out of this whole area of valuation, valuation of nature's services, ecosystem service valuation as we call it now. It, it's been an area which has been dying to get attention and dying is probably an appropriate word because whilst we ignore uh, the economic invisibility of nature, ecosystems die, species die and genetic uh, banks are lost. So this is the, the background in, in a quick few sentences. Uh, I must say I'm delighted to be in this very special audience because it's not often that one gets this kind of open environment. Um, Anders, thank me, thank you for pulling me in here, and a special welcome to Gretchen Daly. And I was saying to uh, Anders that you know having Gretchen here, by the way, those who don't know, is the author of uh, a book which began this all for me, which, <laughs> which was many years ago. This is like I could be a physics professor standing and talking about special and general relativity, and suddenly I look up and there's Albert Einstein in the audience. <laughs> <So> <laughs> So I feel a bit like that, Gretchen, but I'm so happy to have you here. That's right. So anyway, but uh, today also I want to leave the floor a little bit open and give a bit of time for all of you to ask the questions that you'd like to ask, because this whole business of valuing nature is not without its own uh, complexities, its own controversies, and its own challenges. So, And that's where I want to begin, which is, why do you need to value nature? I mean, isn't it obvious? You're a human being. You're part of nature. If nature weren't there, there would be no place for society, there would not be humanity, there would not be an economy. What's the point of valuation? Isn't this blindingly obvious? Yes, it is blindingly obvious. Do we behave as if this is blindingly obvious? Do we conserve ecosystems as if this is blindingly obvious? Do we respect biodiversity as if it's blindingly obvious? No, we don't. And why is that? Ah, because there's policy, there's economics, there's business, there's this, there's that. Suddenly you're into a different dimension of life, as in the economic dimension, the policy dimension. And you suddenly realize that the reason why it's important to connect these two dimensions, nature and ecology on the one hand, and economics and, and uh, valuation through valuation on the other, is because we are in a society where economics dominates. Political economy determines our lives. Economics has become the currency of policy. You can't, even though you may be right, as in morally right, intuitively right, you may have all the right reasons for conserving nature or respecting an ecosystem, but you will not be listened to because you don't make economic sense or because you haven't made an economic case. And that's the way that we are. This is today's society. I didn't invent it. I landed up in it. I spent 24 odd years being a banker with an interest in environmental economics, which I had kind of studied way back and then getting more and more passionate about it and wondering, this is obvious. Now, why don't people think this is obvious? And as I got more and more interested in the subject and started writing about it, and it became more and more a puzzle to me as to, you know, this is not only obvious, but it's the most important thing to be aware of. And we are doing not, nothing to improve that awareness. And I think that's, that's where, where I came from with this uh, concern that the economic invisibility of nature is a serious problem. Our inability to grasp the dimensions of that problem and its consequences are going to be a serious cost to nature, to society, to the economy, to humanity, to everything. And we better get this sorted out fast. So in, in essence, it's about the economic rationale that drives today's society and the fact that economic invisibility in that kind of world is not a good solution. It's because when we start uh, addressing the losses, you really need a lot of range of knowledge. And this is where TEEP comes in, because TEEP's not uh, I was a study leader of TEEB, you can say kind of the manager or, or the orchestrator of TEEB with a passion and an interest in the topic. But the, the authors of TEEB were more than 250 people and we had more than 200 reviewers. So if you think about the total community of TEEB, it's about 500 odd people who were involved in compiling these TEEB reports. You need that. You need that richness and that breadth of knowledge of what happens where, how, at the local level, at the policy level. Uh, and without that diversity and richness, you would not be able to create something that is truly um, 
complete in the way that it's trying to address a problem of these dimensions. So that's another reason. And the second is that whilst undertaking this exercise, you're actually writing for different audiences because it doesn't suffice to just write one book because it may be the right book for the international policymakers may not be quite right for national policymakers. It may be right for the developed economies, but not for the developing world. It may be right for all policymakers in all economies and, and, and international, but it may be useless for people at the administrative level, people in municipalities, in cities, in towns, where they have to manage local biodiversity and, and interfaces between local areas and local ecosystems and themselves. It may be right for all of those and still be not enough because you haven't addressed the business world. How does the business recognize and value its impacts on the ecosystems and why is that important? And finally, and that's the beauty of it, it's also something that was needed because there are success stories. There are many, many examples, and I hope to discuss some of these with you today, where policymakers, local administrators, businesses, and NGOs have gotten together and actually come up with a worked out solution which uses the economics of ecosystem services and achieves a positive result for nature and for the economy. So these are the broad, I would say, four reasons why valuation is key and why TEAB was actually necessary to bring it and give it the profile that it deserves. Uh, frankly, it deserved for a long time, but it's just that it wasn't being done uh, in a way that was maybe aggressive enough or forceful enough uh, to grab the attention of policymakers and business. And has, is this a new problem? So let you, 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 you work it out. The, the um, classical economist, uh, considered one of the fathers of economics, Adam Smith, talked about the diamond water paradox, uh, which is called in, as it's called in textbooks. And he talked about the fact that there are some things which have value in use, like water, uh, but not value in exchange. In other words, they have a lot of use, but not high price. And there are other things which have value in exchange, in other words, high price, like a diamond, but not much use. There's not much you can... Well, Maybe actually pardon to the ladies, but you might like to wear the odd dime in the odd time, but you know, not much else you can do with it. So this has been known that human beings have not really understood either the nature of value or the value of nature. And this has been understood for the last 230, sorry, 240 years now. So this is not a new problem. And Benjamin Franklin said this, and if anyone in the audience knows, please tell me, but I haven't been able to find out where exactly he said this or which year he wrote this. So I presume he said it sometime before when he was born and when he died. Hence the, <laughs> <laughs> hence, hence the range. But I do know exactly when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. When you talk to um, journalists, and I, I just had a, a press interview, they in, the first question is, so what is the price of nature? <laughs> infinity how about that for a number and uh, this, we have this amazing obsession with big global numbers and uh, to some extent it was necessary because the fact that here was a world within which we lived with delivered ecosystem services which were valuable which was completely non-recognized probably needed a jolt to people to make them think that in fact that's not true and that jolt perhaps came to them first in the most powerful way through a study done by Bob Costanza and some others which was published by Nature in 1997, that was some time back. And that study had, I mean there are lots of things about the study which people criticize and indeed sometimes I have criticized, but the great thing about the study was that it was bold and it made a statement and it shocked people into a level of uh, uh, sort of discomfort maybe with the existing system which was nice. So they calculated on the basis of extrapolations uh, a value of um, 38 trillion uh, approximately for the total services of nature at a time when, uh, sorry, of, of uh, 18 to 61 trillion for the services of nature at a time when the global economy, the global GDP was only 38 trillion. And that shocked people. How can this be possible? Surely man and his great production engines are the are masters of the universe. What the hell is this nature thing all about? You know, can't be that big. Yeah. And then more, more scientific and more, more measured was a more limited study by Bamford, but still a global study in 2002, where Andrew Bamford, a Cambridge uh, a scientist, and uh, others put together a calculation which showed that using some of uh, Costanza's background database of information, that if you worked out what would be the marginal benefits of increasing conservation on land to 15% of the land mass from its current levels of 12, 12 odd percent, and if you increase conservation in the oceans from almost nothing to 30% of the oceans, which uh, in conversation we can, uh, we can talk about, it's not actually impossible, uh, then 
the value of, of doing that would be of the order of several trillion dollars, but the cost of that conservation would be only $45 billion per year. So the value was almost 100 times the value of the benefits that you get from nature were calculated by him and his team as almost 100 times versus the costs. Once again, a global number. And these served a purpose in terms of waking people up, but what they didn't do was to result in action because, as everyone knows, there isn't such a thing as a government of Earth. So there isn't a president of Earth or a prime minister of the planet to whom you can go and say, sir, you know, if you don't act on this, I will not vote for you. Um, that was a challenge. But of course, the flip side is that there is a way forward if you go down to the national, to the local, to the biome, to the local level. And that's what TEEB is really all about. Uh, the TEEP stands for the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If I was wise in hindsight, I would not have called it that. Um, people as, as expert as, um, I still remember, the, at the head of international uh, journalists at the London Club of Journalists, which launched the TEEP for Business report, got confused when he was trying to introduce the topic. He said that there's Mr. Sukhdev, uh, uh, the lead author of the... the, the Economics of uh, the e the ecosystem. No, the the economics of biodiversity and ecosystems. And at that moment, I had this epiphany, saying, "Oh my God, I've made a few mistakes in life, and this was one." And just calling it Teeb. So, if if I could go back in time and rewrite it, I would have called it the economics of nature. Ten T E N. Wonderfully simple. It would have been launched in 2010, so nobody could forget it. I mean, and and you know, ten is a nice number, right? So here's Muggins, stupid, uh, sorry, you know, made a mistake, but I'll try to get my next project the right name <laughs> if I'm lucky. Anyway, so coming back to the T perspective on valuation, the perspective of these 500 plus people, here's how we see it. We see it as a human institution. We don't see it as just an exercise. We see it as a human institution much the way as Douglas North would have seen taxes and constitutions as human institutions. Uh, so is valuation. And it consists of three layers, if you like. You can recognize value. You can recognize value without ever touching the economics of anything. And, uh, sorry. You can recognize value by basically saying that there is a need for patrimony to be preserved, there is a need for um, uh, heritage, human heritage to be preserved. I would like my future generations to see what I see. Therefore, uh, let's declare a new protected area. And economics has not come into this. This is about a sense of patrimony. Or you could be um, um, a tribal in a forest in Brazil or in India, and you could take the view that this forest, this, ma this sacred grove next to me is sacred because my ancestor spirits live here, or because my deity, my presiding deity lives here. Therefore, I will do anything for it. I will die for this sacred grove. You valued it at infinity based on a belief. So there was no economics in that choice. So you can actually do valuation by recognizing value. You don't need the economics. But sometimes you need the economics by demonstrating the value. It works. And if you demonstrate that the value of um, bees and insects for pollination is high, then you might be able to convince policymakers to not undertake certain choices in order to make sure that there are enough bees and pollinators. Or as in the case which I'll describe to you of Nakivovo Swamp, but let me hold that for a moment. But if you recognize that there are these different ways of recognizing value, demonstrating value, capturing value means someone actually pays somebody for the value that they have received from the nature's uh, bounty that they receive thanks to your not damaging what, what provides the benefit. So one party withholds, for example, uh, agricultural practices which would have polluted waters and therefore ends up producing maybe less agricultural output but is paid by the other party downstream for having undertaken that practice. So one person pays for the value that was provided to the other. So that's effectively a capture of value. And that's an example of what we call a payment for ecosystem service. PES stands for that. Sorry. So if we look at this universe of valuations, forms of valuation, recognizing or demonstrating or capturing value, there are actually different types of strategies which we talk about in, our, in the TEAB reports. And these strategies basically could be either regional plans where you've understood that certain ecosystems are of value for certain reasons and therefore you amend your land use plans to reflect that understanding. 
So once again, you haven't really worked out the economics, but you've sort of made the right broad choices based on an understanding of how things work on the ground. Uh, you can have legislation, such as what I talked about, where you've decided that because of patrimony, the Yellowstone National Park is going to be conserved, or whatever the equivalent here in Sweden is. Um, and then you could go to economic mechanisms, like creating certification, allowing, for instance, in South Africa, the, in the Feinbos uh, region, um, certain farmers, if they follow certain careful practices towards local biodiversity, their wine can be certified as Feinbos friendly, which means more people like us would buy it and it's priced better and so on. Um, and then there are protected area valuations and evaluations of protected areas where protected areas sometimes get bigger budgets or um, better conservation because they've been found to generate useful economic values in terms of freshwater quality or availability, in terms of soil nutrients, in terms of ecotourism, uh, in terms of biodiversity to the local populations that surround them. So these are all examples of strategies that enable you to demonstrate the value. And then finally, of course, there are payments for ecosystem services. Now, the interesting thing is that the number of these examples that are there is, is huge. It's, within the TEAB reports, we have more than 120 documented examples of policy having changed by doing one of the above and then ending up with a better result. And I think that's part of what I said, the need to broadcast success stories so that people can see them, understand them, and hopefully try and replicate them, or even in the same place or in, a, in another place, scale them. In other words, increase the number or the size of the area that's covered by those practices. And these different strategies fall under broadly three kinds of, of uh, categories of uh, uh, responses, policy responses, human responses. At the largest or the outermost level is basically norms and regulations and policies. Regional plans and legislations are examples of that. Certification, evaluation of protected areas, and payments for ecosystem services are really mechanisms. They are economic mechanisms. In many cases, in fact, uh, a study was done recently where more than 98% of all of us, whatever the numbers, must be like one in 50 was not, but the remaining 49 were actually examples where one legislator had met with and decided a price with another legislator. In other words, a department, for example, a water department in a city would meet with uh, a provincial area a farming province regulator and decide a price for changing certain agricultural practices. So that's not really, in my mind, as a person who's dealt markets. Markets mean something where there's depth, there's liquidity, there's commodities that are traded. Uh, this is hardly a commodity because it happens once. It ha happens between two parties, one buyer and one seller, and they sit down like two, for example, like two uh, august Chinese senior bureaucrats sitting down over a drink and deciding how much the uh, northern municipality in Beijing should be paid by Beijing municipality for farmers changing practices there. I, if you like, you can call that a market, but I don't, as a person who spent 25 odd years in markets. But it's an economic mechanism. And the beauty is that even though markets are the automatic assumption of the end game where people are going with this dialogue, the beauty is that, in fact, when I look at our own TEAB reports, we have the 120 examples, and actually there are only two which are markets examples and one is from Australia and the other one's from the US. What I would call markets, as in a biodiversity market uh, or a, a wetland banking market. So there's not much of markets in this whole area of the economics of ecosystems. There's a lot of economics, there's a lot of policy, and there's a lot of local action. And I think that's the key thing to take away from this. That this is not about you know, walking into a supermarket and buying milk, bread, eggs, nature, you know, all for a price. And I can never forget someone who, was, who should have known better, who tried to convince me to participate in a film. This was way back in the TEAB interim report days. And I will not name the august institution from which that person came, otherwise I might get, lose some 8,000 friends. Uh, but um, actually tried to convince me that you know, we, the solution has to be that you know, bees and butterflies have to carry like price tags to them, wonder about. And we were in a park in Bonn, and he actually tried to convince me, say, so what is the value of that butterfly? And I said, well, you know, so it doesn't work like that. This park is a natural area, I agree. There's a gate out there, gate out there. You and I walked in free. You know, if we had been charged two euros or five euros, we would still have walked in, right? Yes, yes. So, okay, so then multiply the number of people visiting this area who would have paid two euros, five euros, and 10 euros, then work out what is the effective value of this park. He said, huh? I said, yeah, that's what it's about. He said, no, 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 that, 
So we didn't really have a film. It didn't actually happen. Thank God for that. Otherwise, <laughs> But this is the problem, that when we talk about valuing ecosystem services, we talk about the value of nature, different people think different things. And unfortunately, we have to be careful how we take it forward. Now, let me give you my favorite example of each of these strat strategies. As I said, regional planning, legislation, certification, protected area evaluation, and payments for ecosystem services. So here's an example of a regional plan in China from the Boxing County, which was changed. I think Gretchen's here, you recognize the map. This is one of your examples. And a great use of uh, software which she and her colleagues have, have uh, introduced called INVEST, which is basically a way of measuring what comes from where. In other words, what ecosystem services, soil, nutrient, cycling, freshwater provisioning, comes from where and benefits whom, where. And when you know that and you map it out properly, then you can make sensible decisions as to what areas to convert into agricultural land or what areas to convert into alternative uh, human habitation and so on. That helps you improve, and that's what happened here in the Boxing County. An example of a legislation introduced was just after the, um, uh, the 1998 bleaching event in the Philippines at Tubata National Park. And there we had uh, literally a kind of congress created of local fishermen, of local NGOs, of local government, of national government, of international NGOs, all meeting together and coming to the conclusion that uh, the bleaching event was a disaster that happened as coral reefs died as a result, and that to prevent uh, that situation from happening, you couldn't do much about climate change because that's not in your hands, but you can manage how you access that coral reef area, and they decided to create a no-go zone um, around the Tobata coral reef, and that was so successful at restoring uh, coral cover. I think uh, there was an observed 10% increase in coral cover for the next several years per annum, and uh, the fish biomass actually increased fourfold over that period. So as a result of that, they increased the area. Uh, in 2010, they actually increased that with an additional buffer zone around that. So here's an example of a legislation that resulted in people recognizing the value of nature. But sometimes it's useful to do the economic calculations. And here's an example where it was useful. This uh, place looks quite pretty in the picture, but it's actually a swamp. When you go there, you'll be stung by mosquitoes and hundreds of other insects. Not so, not so nice. But this swamp is a very useful swamp. It has economic use because this is where the uh, sewage of the city of Kampala flows into. Human sewage basically gets broken up by bacteria in, in the swamp becomes food for fishes effectively and there is a local community there which fishes so it's got value but mostly its value is breaking up human sewage it's a sewage treatment plant natural and it's free and the plan was to dam this area and convert it into more land for agriculture and other uses until an economist from the IUCN wrote a short paper saying that this doesn't make sense because the economic value of the ecosystem service of sewage treatment provided by the fl by the uh, the swamp is several times higher than the alternative value of using it for other areas after accounting for the costs of conversion of this, of this swamp. And thankfully, based on that economic analysis, that demonstration of value, the uh, city of Kampala decided to change that decision, and it's still there. It doesn't look as pristine now as it, as it did then, but it's still there, and it's part of the green belt. And finally, examples of payments for ecosystem services and certification. These are the two economic mechanisms I mentioned which do work. And this is an example uh, from uh, Japan, from the Toyooka city, which is in Honshu, the main, the big island in Japan, on, on the northern side of that. And um, the white stork, which was a bird beloved of the Japanese, had gone extinct here in the, in the late 60s. Uh, they've always sort of tried and hankered after this because there's an emotional bond. There's a connection between the Japanese and their stalks. And they've always wanted to have this back but could never quite figure out. They kept a few breeding pairs from Siberia. And then finally they realized that what was needed was a change in the way they managed rice. So they went away from uh, dry rice, which used less water, to one which used more water, wet paddy, reintroduced organic farming, paddy farming. And as a result of that, uh, their stalk pairs started breeding. And so basically they had their own revival of an extinct, locally extinct species which came back. I've actually been here and I've at least seen two of the 40 breeding pairs that they claim to have. So it seems to be working. Um, the interesting thing about this example is the reason it worked is because an incentive was provided. 
payment for ecosystem services to those farmers who decided to get into paddy farming, in other words, organic farming. And that incentive has been reduced from uh, 40,000 yen per thousand square meters, which is one block, uh, to 7,000 yen. It still carries on. Now, the practice has become popular, so it carries on despite the subsidy being reduced. And the second aspect of this was certification, which is that rice, which was grown in this way in the Toyoka, was branded and sold as Konotoro uh, Namai, basically the, the white stalk rice. And it was sold as either organically friendly or pure organic rice. In other words, reduced pesticide use or zero pesticide use and organic farming. And the net result is that the farmers who packaged and sold this right would realize prices of 20 to 50 percent higher than the normal price. So therefore, they were actually getting more value from this form of farming. And that's an example of certification working in favor of uh, an uh, ecologically friendly practice. As, as when things work, they really work. So not only all of that benefit and the, the species gets restored, but the, they opened a museum, which I visited in, in the city of Toyoka. And the museum gets lots of tourist visitors. It's, about, it's basically telling the story in, in a typical museum form. And the revenue from that museum and the tourism is something like a billion yen per annum, which is about $10 million. Um, and that's quite a lot for them, because that means an increase in their perfecture earnings of 1.4%. And I can tell you from my days in Asia as a banker that in Japan, anything that's above 0.01% is actually considered a large number in growth terms. So that's, that's significant. Yeah. Anyway, long and short of it is that the TEEP perspective, and I will go more into detail uh, with, uh, with a few more aspects of valuation, but the TEEP perspective has, is, broadly aggregate, is, is broadly around five themes. One is that the decision of valuation itself has trade-offs. Because the moment you get into the space of thinking that you can value an ecosystem service, you've made a certain choice in terms of how you relate with nature. If you are a Yanomami tribal in Brazil or, or a tribal in, in Rajasthan in, in India, it, you don't get into that mindset because you are part of that ecosystem and valuing it would be a bit like asking a local fisherman somewhere to value the oceans. Oh, idea, I just go and fish and I live off it and this is my life. And to them, or for that matter, ask, asking the Toda tribals in the Nilgiri Hills um, to value uh, their, uh, uh, their flowers because they use five, more than 500 types of flowers as part of their rituals. How would they value their biodiversity? Because their entire cultural life would stop if there weren't those flowers available at the various times of the year for each and every practice. They even have different flowers for the birth of buffaloes and for the death and cremation of buffaloes, right? So how would you have a Toda tribal if you didn't have the biodiversity around surrounding him, her? So th there are, of course, the moment you get into economic valuation, then it means that you're kind of in a different mindset. You're not thinking like the Toda tribal or the Yanomami or you know, like the tribals in Rajasthan. You're thinking differently. You're thinking like us, if I may put it this, this way. So that's one issue, and that has consequences. Secondly, who values matters? Is it, is this, is the valuation being conducted at the national level by a government? Is it being done by the individual? Is it being done by the community? This makes a huge difference. And it can result in different answers as well. Thirdly, valuation must always, and I will come to a specific case of this, valuation must always have a defined purpose. And when you define the purpose, and if it's a different purpose, in other words, if it's for a payment for ecosystem service, you might follow one approach. But if it's for adjusting national accounts or being part of an exercise to adjust national account, you might follow for the same place and the same service to the same people a different approach. You need to define that purpose. Otherwise, you don't know what you're valuing and why you're valuing it. And valuation, fourthly, has ethical implications. There are uncertainties. There are risks. And we need to be conscious of those risks before we undertake a process of valuation. And finally, in using valuation, one of the things which always draws uh, passion and interest from economists is the use of discount rates. And to this day, I mean, I, I was uh, um, fortunate as well as challenged to, to teach a course at Yale, wonderful students, but one of them, till the last 26 lecture, refused to accept that a social discount rate had meaning. He would insist, why is it not the same as the interest rate? So you, sometimes you just can't win. You know? And this is a perfectly intelligent guy, but he doesn't, doesn't see it that way. I would argue that the social discount rate is different because it's society who's deciding the value of something in the future versus today. It's not your ability to, bo as an individual to borrow money and finance an object today versus tomorrow, or its utility today versus tomorrow, or as an individual to make a choice today versus tomorrow. 
if I were the, the president of Yale University, I'd make a different choice about the trees in surrounding Yale versus me as a tourist visiting Yale. I might not just care about them, I'd be interested in the buildings. So I'd have different valuation, different ethical choices being made depending on who you are. But people sometimes don't accept that, but I do. And I think it is important to recognize that discounting and what, interest, what, what discount rates you use is an ethical choice. It's not as simple as just plucking an interest rate from a Reuters screen which says, this is the interest rate for three months and that's the one for three years. It's not as simple as that. Who picks and who discounts matters. What it is for matters. Whether it's cash or whether it's a good or a service matter. And lastly and most importantly to me, whether it's a public or a private good matters. Because that in turn has implications on who values and what kind of discounting. So these are some of the issues that uh, T brings as perspectives, as key thematic perspectives in the way that valuation should be done. So let me say a few words and only a few because otherwise we'll be here till tomorrow on some of these issues in terms of the long-term implications and trade-offs of valuation. Um, two key risks are, are this, that you know, as I mentioned, you place a value on nature, you change your concept. You're kind of assuming that you can value and then that has its own implications. You, you undertake what is potentially a commodity fiction. You can potentially create a commodity fiction, as in treat nature as if it were a commodity. You don't have to, but you can. It's a risk. And another uh, issue is that um, if the value and if the valuation process and evaluation hasn't been done before and just not part of thinking, you are completely changing the way individuals respond. And this may make um, uh, local communities who are otherwise perfectly comfortable with their environments and making national, uh, uh, rational choices between what they use for agriculture and what they use for forestry make completely different choices which could have implications and ramifications which you didn't, uh, uh, didn't bargain for. Um, collective decision making can sometimes be very powerful and there, there's a lot of good uh, research and economic uh, thinking that suggests that is the case in conservation. But if you go about a valuation approach, you can end up defeating that objective by taking an individual's view or taking a national perspective driven by some uh, Ministry of the Environment, for example. So these things matter. They are risks. Cultural issues, anthropological, psychological issues. I mean, th there are numerous issues here. And uh, should we just accept uh, a, the, econo the traditional economic approach to valuation should we think more in terms of behavioral economics. All these are issues that we really have to grapple with before we undertake valuation. Uh, those who are interested, th there's a lot here, uh, but at the same time there's not a lot here because at the end of the day, it, to me, it becomes an ethical choice of uh, why you should value and if you should value. Um, but there is a lot here, and those who are interested should log into something called TEAB at Yale. Just do Google search for TEAB at Yale, and you'll find all of this there. It's basically chapter four uh, it, uh, of the TEAB foundational book, the TEAB Ecological and Economic Foundations. And it's uh, a couple of lectures there which will cover this, these areas. Challenges are many. The challenges of valuation are seriously uh, sometimes underestimated. The complexity, the sheer complexity, I think Gretchen will <laughs> vouch for that. The, every place is different, every ecosystem is different, every set of end users for these services of nature are different. The way they value and respond to valuations is different, the implications of that response are different. There just isn't a one-size-fits-all. You can at best go in with certain basic concepts and approaches, hopefully intelligent ones and, and remain flexible and sensitive to local needs and then proceed. But there isn't any one answer and that is part of the complexity. And that's again one of the reasons why uh, these global valuations really only serve a, uh, what I may call an advertising purpose and advertising a problem rather than actually solving it. Because to solve it you need to get onto the ground. Um, there are functional interdependencies. You can't necessarily assume that uh, valuing ecosystem services independently is the same as bunching them together and valuing them together. Um, people who are visiting, it depends who's valuing, not just in terms of which part of society, but who's visiting. If you're valuing an ecosystem service as a visitor, enjoying a national park, that's, that's one valuation. If you are uh, a tribal resident in the same place, you're using different aspects of the ecosystem. You're not particularly interested in the pretty species. You're interested in the wood that you get for firewood, and you're interested in the bamboo that you harvest for building and repairing your cottage, and you're interested in completely different things compared to what the visitor is interested. Your valuation is completely different. So these things are part of the complexity. 
you also have to look at context, and I think this is where some of the work, Gretchen, that you do in terms of the way you map areas is really very helpful because people can just understand systems in their spatial uh, uh, reality and understand what's happening where, understand the underlying flows from nature without getting into the actual dollar numbers first because there's a risk that the dollar numbers end up being pointless. So these are these issues which you need to, which you need to look at. Choosing how to value, choosing how to value, coming to my, my third point, is actually quite complex as well. It's not, um, it's not easy to convert what's complex to, to what's simple. And yet, if you don't simplify, you end up with something which just says, on the one hand this, but on the other hand that, and let's do nothing because actually it's too complex. And sometimes that too complex becomes an excuse for inaction. And that excuse for inaction, as a human being, you can see that this doesn't make sense. What's happening is wrong. We shouldn't be losing this natural area. And someone is pretending that this has no economic value and that development is happening because the alternative is being followed. You can see intuitively that doesn't make sense, but it's held up because nobody has the final answer. There is no god around who can exactly calculate all the values of every ecosystem service to every person who benefits from them and so on. So the choice of valuation can be understood in terms of its complexity in these ways. One is that, are we talking the individual's language or society's language, a community's language? So the rationale, as I mentioned to you, changes and individuals thinking different from society's thinking. The other question you have to ask is, are you talking about uh, what kind of human interaction with nature are you trying to address? And that matters as well. And the third is, is this a simple system or actually is it a complex system? Um, and depending on where you are on that, in that three-dimensional space, you could have a small range of ways of valuing it. You could have, as represented in the larger uh, plane, a larger number of ways of valuing it. And I think this has to be part of the approach. And another way of looking at it is when, how do you choose how to value or what to value? You can think in terms of plurality of value. In other words, is it like commodity type? It's, is it basically about grass that has a price because you harvest the grass and you sell it and this is basically a grassland with one or two species of grass? That's fine, that's commodity type values. Or is it a complex rainforest where yes, there are some fruit and, and nuts that you can harvest and some water flows which you can kind of estimate and the rest is really complicated to try and estimate. So that's, that's one axis. The other axis is how complex is the system that we are talking about? Uh, increasing, uh, increasing that and increasing value polarity is really two ways of saying that you're getting into areas which, which make it difficult for you to value. So ideally, if you can have a simple system in which has very few values, that's the easy thing to value. And maybe you can value things where the system is simple, and, you know, but there are just a few values which you can calculate or maybe even more values. Or if there are many values, but it's a simple system. But if you have a complex system and it has many values, then you are going to face challenges. And I think we have to be conscious of this background when we start valuing. And I'll give you an example of how, um, how this works in reality by saying that these are the sort of questions that we have to ask ourselves. Is the purpose, when we choose how to value, is the purpose clearly stated? Is it for green accounting, for instance? Is it for calculating payments for ecosystem services? And, or is it for sending, setting compensatory payments, as in someone's demolished a forest and what, what uh, penalty should you apply? Is it a penal approach as against a reward approach? That makes a difference. Second question is, whose valuation? Different segments of society will have different interests. The local tribal will have a different interest from the visiting ecotourist, who will have a different interest from the neighborhood farm community, who will have a different interest from the national government or the local government. And how simple do you want to get? Because if you get too simple, you are probably wrong. But if you make it too complex, then you will probably do nothing. So you, there's a, a difficult trade-off, <laughs> there's a choice that you have to make in, in achieving that. And uh, let me give you an example of how, from my own experience, uh, from a, um, a situation I was involved in in my country, in India, a, a policymaker who was seconded to the Supreme Court of India made this choice. I could actually see, it was incredible to see this man going through this and us going back and forth. He had discovered the work that my green accounting project had done. Green accounting basically means adjusting national accounts based on the unaccounted values of 
ecosystem services. And in our case, we even did a calculation for human capital. So it was basically to try and present to the government of India that their GDP calculations and their, their, their you know, fixation with GDP growth and their constant admiring and copying of Chinese-style development was not well advised because they were not getting the reality. So that was the purpose of valuation in the case of our green accounting project. That was in 2003. A couple of years later, this, I get a call from the Supreme Court of India, and normally in India, if you're an Indian especially, you don't want to receive calls from the court or from the police. Right? So my first reaction was like heart sinking and do I, what, what have I done wrong? And no, I hadn't done anything wrong, just to publish this thing called, you know, the value of ecosystem services in India's forest for carbon values and, and can you please tell us, can we use your numbers? I said, yeah, what do you want to use them for? Um, oh, we have this court case where people are saying that the compensatory payments that we had set are complete rubbish and, you know, your numbers are actually, actually lower than ours, so, you know, we don't know why they're saying our numbers are rubbish. So I said, no, you're probably right, sir, but what can I do to help you? Because my calculation is for the purpose of national accounting and I have very conservative numbers. That's why your numbers are probably higher than mine. Then he says, well, can you explain why you're conservative? I said, sure. So I wrote a very simple three-page note explaining on each point all the ecosystem services we had not accounted for, why we had used the assumptions which were at the lowest end of the assumption range to make a difference to the actual GDP versus the adjusted GDP. So we had deliberately said we don't want to be provocative, we want to just make the point that even on the smallest change that you need to adjust these accounts for the uncaptured values of ecosystem services, that's going to be big. That was the reason we were doing it. So I said, look, if we took assumptions in the middle of the range or at the high end of the range, you would get a different answer. So he said, no, no, you must write this down in a note for me. So I said, fine, I'll write this down in a note for you. I thought, you know, the National Service, I'm doing this for the courts. So the note went and that was fine. I get a f further call saying, can you help me with this table I'm preparing? So again, some back and forth. And then six months later, I get this note saying, thank you very much, you know, really helped us. We have won the court case. And I was flabbergasted. So, and they said, we'll send you a copy of our, of our report. So this court report arrives in my hands and I, I had tears in my eyes when I saw 15 references to our project and the valuation tables. It was incredible that, you know, somebody had actually made these choices. Some bureaucrat in the Indian government who had been seconded to the Supreme Court had gone through this thinking, painstakingly making phone calls to me, trying to catch me in my travels and emails, and had gone through and basically he decided that he needed to simplify. He had taken an ethical choice that he didn't want this to be too complex. He thought our work was too complex. He had made his own table which was simple, but it was sensible simple. And he had addressed the problem that his valuation was for a different purpose than our valuation by doing a mapping from one to the other. So this is how he organized. This is taken straight from the court um, uh, proceedings, the, the documented decision. And uh, this is how he broke up the forest in India into very dense, dense and open forests. And there are actually 16 categories of forests in the traditional system in India. And he used six broad categories. And this is how he broke up the values. And because he respected the fact that our valuation was for a different purpose than his, and his was more simple than ours, he also added this paragraph, which was accepted, which is that if you are applying these valuations to either national parks, which means total conservation, or wildlife sanctuaries, which means partial access, but otherwise conservation, then the value has to be multiplied by 10 or multiplied by 5 compared to these, what he called base values used by our project. Now, I don't know whether that's right or wrong. I mean, certainly they would have been higher. In some cases, yes, the ratio would have been 5 or 10. In other cases, not. But this is how an actual legislator, uh, uh, so a, a corporator, what seconded to a Supreme Court, had decided to simplify complexity in order to be able to achieve some decision. And this had been accepted by, by the lawyers. So this is an actual example showing first the risk. For example, if I had not got my cell phone switched on when he called, yeah, he would have simply used our, valued and our values and not recognized the point that this is for national accounting and not for compensatory payments and ended up with a complete nonsense. Secondly, he had the gumption to actually go through the back and forth email correspondence and respond and then have the further gumption to simplify because if he had done something like cut and paste from our tables, nothing would have changed because people have said this is all gobbledygook, you know, this is academic gob gobbledygook. They would not have believed it. But because his table was so much simpler than anything that we'd written, they believed it because it kind of made sense for them. So these are real things. And when we talk about this in theory in the T reports, I'm, I'm glad that we have enough examples as well. And I think that's why we needed the 500 odd people because how do you collect something together of that kind? 
Another, another aspect of valuation is this whole issue of risk and, and the whole issue of uncertainty. I think I've talked about some of the risks and how people address them. Uncertainty is a big one. Now, this image you, re you recognize is the Brazilian rainforest, uh, Amazonian rainforest. And yeah, it's, it's lots of things. It's a carbon store, it's a biodiversity store, it's, it's, a rainfall, it's a rainfall factory and so on. And we actually had, and I'm sharing something that's from within the TEEP team, we actually had a serious internal debate on whether we should go ahead and do a calculation for the Brazil case or based on whatever best uh, papers that we had with us on the rainforest. Because, you know, there was still uncertainty as to the connection between rainforest and rainfall. And of course, you know, there are papers such as Marengo et al. Uh, from the Journal of Climate which suggest and argue that evapotranspiration does actually seed the rainfall and that rainfall seeding function is obviously valuable because that's where you know Mato Grosso, Uruguay, Paraguay and Argentina's granaries in Latin America get their water in some form or the other that's where it comes from and that's valuable. The agricultural economy of this region is something like 250 billion dollars, a quarter of a trillion dollars and obviously the economic invisibility of the freshwater cycle or the fresh freshwater function of the rainforest is a hugely powerful, at least an instrument, which if it were recognized in some way, if it were into policy, if it were into international discourse, uh, the answer for what to do would be different. But it's not. And we had to make a take a call on whether we um, include this point or not include it in T, because these were always consensus decisions. Uh, finally, the argument that, that I use to convince my colleagues that we should include it with all the caveats is very simple that look, what you're saying is there is uncertainty because you don't have scientific proof. You haven't proven this. But then go back to Karl Popper and his theory of scientific proof, which is that, yeah, it's falsifiability. My point is that if you are trying to falsify, you know, something like calculating the speed of light and working it out based on two angles or something like that, that's fine. You can do that. Or if you falsify a an experiment in chemistry or physics, it's easy, it's painless, it doesn't cost life. Try working the logic of falsifiability on this. And what it would mean is that the theory is that this thing has evapotranspiration with seeds rainfall. How do you disprove this theory? Well, you need to cut this off completely and do it a few times and see whether rainfall reduced as a result of doing it. That would be the Popperian answer. But the fact is, you know, I mean, I don't have to explain further. That's the whole problem. This is the science of life. You can't apply the science of physics and chemistry to this. And that's, that's the challenge. So you do have to make ethical choices and a few jumps, if you like, in what is an ethical space of, yes, we will go ahead and do this, despite the fact that, no, we don't have 100% or incontrovertible scientific proof of the fact that, the, uh, that this happens. Uh, two final points I want to talk about. One is we keep talking about valuation as a feedback mechanism, and this goes back to where I began. If we were connected with nature, uh, if we intuitively were able to respond in society as perhaps intuitively we do at a personal level, there would be no need for a feedback because we were with it. Kind of. <laughs> we need the feedback mechanism of, of valuation because that makes us understand things in a language and in a context, which is an economic context, which is part of today's system. Today's system of using economics as the basis for uh, assessing trade-off choices and as the basis for making policy decisions. And this is uh, a very important aspect of valuation. It is a feedback mechanism, especially to the society which has disconnected from nature. And to recreate that connection in language that it understands within a framework that it understands, an economic argument actually holds very strong sway. So finally, a checklist. And uh, this, again, is basically something that we, we try and advise when we are working with country teams who are working on valuations. Uh, you need to make sure that your valuations are marginal valuations, marginal costs, marginal benefits. You need to ensure that they are context-specific. Please don't go for generalities. Um, Make sure you define the purpose of valuation. Make sure that it's used for the right policy and human context. Location, likewise. Uh, and work on the basis of scenarios. At the end of the day, valuation is what we have today versus what we might have if we changed a policy or if we changed a particular structure or if we changed land use or whatever. And then the question is, how would the value received by people be different in situation this versus situation that? So it is about scenarios. So uh, ensure that scenarios are meaningful. And 
using models and using modeling is absolutely part of valuation. And all I can say is model with care. Sometimes we have benefits estimated more easily than costs. Sometimes people who are doing restoration uh, work do not calculate or record their costs simply because they're doing it out of passion and that's just not their thing. And at the same time, when you're working on costs versus benefits, how can you calculate anything when you only have one side? And these are some of the issues that we work about. So in conclusion, uh, it's been often, TIB has often been accused by people who only read. It's beautiful how it's journalists reading things that other journalists have written, who are then reading things that NGOs have written, who have based it on the other journalists. So it's kind of a triangle of journalist A, journalist B, and NGO C. And each is quoting each other. And I'm wondering, like, Alice in Wonderland, like, where did they get this from? Which part of TIB did I, did I not read or not write? And how did this happen? And the answer is, well, you didn't. I mean, they just decided that they want to say this. So. There we are. So, and on the basis of that, they conclude that TIB is about selling Mother Nature. Despite that, everything that I've summarized for you and the slides and everything is basically physically in the TIB reports. There's nothing here from me originally. All of it is consensus work. It's all there. But yet, people are saying TIB is selling Mother Nature. Fine. Uh, so, but it's not, I can assure you. And I think you would be convinced now. And it's not a simple minded or a cost pure, simple, cost benefit based stewardship model for the whole Earth. You know, that global approach, which is nice to, again, talk about to journalists to make them understand what the issues are, is actually not much use. It is about preventing the economic invisibility of nature from leading to bad policies and poor trade-offs. And yes, it is about recognizing value. It is about demonstrating value. It is about capturing value and rewarding the benefits of ecosystem services and biodiversity to society in general and to poor people in particular, who are sometimes the ones who benefit the most and who suffer the most when they lose it. So, in summary, this is not the deep perspective on valuation. Thank you very much. Thanks.